curiosity. I halted, bobby pin and screwdriver hovering between me and the wall safe as Steelhoof's muttered comment. This safe was the only container within the Helping Hoof Clinic which hadn't been successfully scavenged by ponies before us. Anything that could hold valuables had already been looted. Brighter spots on faded walls showed where medical boxes, probably locked, had simply been torn away from their mountings. Huh? Eloquent as always, little Pip. Steelhoof's whinnied. Your little friend, Homage, asked me what I thought your defining characteristic was. What? When? Oh, goddesses. What did Steelhoof tell her? Please don't let it be bad. Or embarrassing. While you were hospitalized, Steelhoof responded bluntly. Do you really find it surprising that you would ask your companions about you? No, not really. She was probably trying to get to know the real me more especially before taking our relationship to a whole new level. It was wise. I just wasn't sure Steelhose was the pony I would have wanted her getting a reference from. What did you say? I asked nervously, and then felt immediately stupid. He just answered that, didn't he? I mean, okay, curiosity. That isn't so bad. Yeah, I'm curious. I don't think you could call it my defining characteristic, though. We're walking into hell. Velvet Remedy interjected, and Little Pip is sightseeing. No, I argued. I'm not. I stopped talking at her knowing smile. Hey, the clinic was right here, right on our way, and you know we could use some more medical supplies if we find any. Yep, y'all should have seen Little Pip on Stable 24, Calamity agreed. Mimicking my voice, poorly I might add, he called out. Dangerous critters, let's explore. Hey, you're the one that wanted to go on the next adventure with me. I figure she's been like this ever since stepping hoof out of her own stable, Calamity concluded. Reckon I can't blame her, living in a box. Oh no, Velvet Remedy chimed in. She was like this inside the stable too. I sighed. Apparently this was going to be the teased little pip day. I turned away, choosing to focus on the wall safe. Let them have their fun. Velvet continued. When the other colts and fillies decided to try new things in an effort to provoke their cutie marks in the showing, they'd try soccer. Or ballet. Little Pip? She tries to invent the art of breaking into other ponies' private things. I broke the bobby pin. Which was really frustrating, since this lock was well beneath my skills. I took a deep breath, looking in a random direction that was neither the safe nor my friends. Pirelet had perched on an IV stand in the corner near a medical bed. Behind her was a Ministry of Peace poster and a smiling Fluttershy with a white rabbit sitting on her head, and colorful birds and butterflies flocking around her. The top of the poster read simply, Remember. But the bottom half was so badly damaged that I couldn't tell what it was trying to say. There must have been some gentle but insidious power in Fluttershy's image, for I found myself feeling ashamed that we had forgotten what she had told us not to do. Well, I grunted, hovering out a replacement bobby pin. Maybe curiosity is my virtue then. My three companions looked at each other quietly, skeptically. Pilot let out a soft whoop as smiles broke across their faces, or at least across the muzzles of Calamity and Velvet Remedy. Simultaneously, they turned to me and told me that no, it was definitely a vice. Well, that was unexpected, Calamity noted, staring through the open safe into the building adjacent to the Helping Hoof Clinic. The entire back of the safe was gone, as was a significant amount of the other building's wall. Judging by the damage, it looked as if a large magical energy weapon on the scale of the Junction R7 cannon had been used to melt through the wall. Some pony had a hard-on for this safe. Then they were stupid, I commented. That blast probably destroyed anything that was in here. Steelhoof spoke. I don't think this was the safe they were intending to use that weapon for. How do you figure? First, this safe was hidden. It's likely they didn't even know it was here. Steelhoofs was right. The safe had been hidden behind a large, framed sign. Most scavengers wouldn't have thought to pull it down and look behind it. But, ever since Amage revealed her safe behind the Splendid Valley painting, I'd fallen into the habit of peeking behind frames, something which undoubtedly added fodder to my companion's discussion of my so-called vice. I glanced over to where the sign was propped against a medical rack. It was very much unlike the posters I had grown used to. A more forthright and clinical warning from the past. Wartime Stress Disorder, 
For over a thousand years, ponies have known only peace. It should be no surprise, then, that many are not able to cope with the harsh realities of war. Wartime stress disorder is a very real illness that affects thousands of ponies each year. Know what to look for. Depression, anxiety, lack of sleep, loss of appetite, unpatriotic thoughts, and suicidal impulses. If you or any of your loved ones are experiencing two or more of these symptoms, it may be WSD. If so, ask for help. No pony needs to suffer alone. Knowledgeable and caring ponies trained by the Ministry of Peace are waiting to help. I spared it only a glance before turning my attention back to Steelhoofs. Having read the sign before floating it down, I didn't need to read it again. Second, Steelhoofs continued, apparently having paid more attention to our surroundings than I had. The building next to the clinic was a bank. I had admittedly dismissed the building next door after discovering the door was blocked by interior rubble. I could see now, through the safe, that a fair amount of the interior was intact, and a bank promised to be interesting. Okay, I said, floating out the zebra rifle. I'm going through. I started to climb up into the safe, only to feel teeth bite down on my tail and pull me back. Oh no you ain't, Calamity said, letting go. Ain't no way any rest of us can wiggle through that thing, he said, pointing a hoof at the wall safe. I opened my mouth to protest, but he cut me off. I ain't letting you brave that place alone. Whatever destroyed that wall might still be lurking there. Calamity smirked. Besides, you said your next adventure would be with me. You promised, and I'm holding you to it. I slumped. He had a point. Then I brightened. Once I'm inside, I'll be able to see the rubble blocking the front door and levitate it out of the way. I can let you all in through the front. It'll only take a moment. They looked at each other again, and I could read on their faces a begrudging acceptance that this was going to happen. I set my hoofs to it. There was no stopping me short of a tranquilizer dart to the breast. I floated the zebra rifle ahead of me, my current weapon of choice. Calamity and I had spent time in the early morning looting the locked ammo boxes from surviving convoy chariots on the overpass. As a result, I was no longer worried about ammo for the zebra rifle. I had been surprised to find that, even up here, everything that wasn't locked up had been looted. But Calamity reminded me that he wasn't the only flyer in the equestrian wasteland. I counted us lucky when we had moved beyond Hellhound territory and into the jagged hellscape of Philadelphia suburbs without any encounters. During our trek, Calamity and I had scouted ahead, being by far the most stealthy members of our group. I had kept my pit-buck radio off. Only the tiniest amount of noise leaked out of my ear bloom for others to possibly hear, but I suspected the keen-eared Hellhounds might notice even that. I was yearning to turn it on again and hear what else Red Eye might have to say. With a second look at the safe, I decided to shuck my saddlebags. It was going to be tight, and I didn't want to get stuck. I could float them through behind me once I was inside. Or, worst case, go back in the clinic and get them after I cleared the bank's front door. No encounters also meant that I still owed Calamity an adventure, and I wanted to pay off that debt before we got into the heart of Philadelphia. We were looking at trotting into slaver territory, and I feared for my companion's safety. It's not that I doubted their ability, or their courage but the anxiety I felt didn't lend itself easily to the words. I suppose I feared that my friends were not only dear to me, but would be dear to them in an entirely different and unpleasant way. In the eyes of the slavers, what kind of prize would a Pegasus be? Or Velvet Remedy? The goddesses only know how they would react to a Steel Ranger, and the last thing I could afford to do was launch an assault on an entire damn slaver army. Honestly, I was almost to Philadelphia, and I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there. My entire plan was to get there, take a look, and pray that what I saw would tell me where to go next. With dismay, I accepted the very real possibility that I might get there only to turn around and slink back home. My friends were counting on me to be better than that. All those slaves were counting on some pony to stand up for them. I suddenly pictured myself trotting up to a gate, knocking and telling the guard on the other side, Hello, I'm here to stand up for the slaves. The daydream ended with the image of me getting shot in the head. So yeah, maybe I was sightseeing. Distractions to give myself time. I pulled myself up into the narrow black rectangle of the safe and slithered through. A mare approached me just the other day. Thank you, Red Eye, she said. You've given my life meaning. I was wretched before, but now I am part of something great and I know that something even greater awaits me, 
the opportunity of a lifetime. Of course, she was only saying this in an attempt to get close to me so she could use the crude knife she had crafted out of stolen metal. But still, her words moved me, so I did not have her killed on the spot. Instead, I sent her to the pit, where she would have the chance to exercise those murderous impulses for a more worthy goal. Velvet Remedy had darted off into the mayor's room off the bank lobby, and we were all politely pretending not to hear her. The lobby radio helped, Red Eye's words adding to the buzzing of the flies. Looking around, it pained me that my stomach wasn't rebelling nearly as hard. The stench made my eyes water, but I had seen too much too often. I could tell I was becoming numb, and it scared the horse apples out of me. I heard water start to run in one of the restroom sinks, and I felt the sudden urge to dash in. We hadn't checked the local water, but I was sure it was radioactive. Velvet must know that, but I doubted she was thinking clearly. Splayed pony bodies and profane graffiti, Velvet said with a weak smile as she rejoined us. Raider chic. She turned to me. Let me thank you again for taking me to such lovely places. I honestly felt bad about this one. Once, the lobby had been a place for ponies to mill around while waiting for their turn with one of the tellers whose counters lined one side of the room, or who had business in the back meeting rooms like the one I had crawled into through the safe whose backside had been obliterated. But the raiders had taken a perverse glee in defiling this place, the extent of which I hadn't seen since the Ponyville Library. The crucified dog hanging from the ceiling lamp was a particularly revolting touch. I grew a little pip, Calamity noted having taken a look at the rear meeting room which had abutted the clinic. Raiders living here tussled with some invaders who were a heap more dangerous. Lots of raider bodies, none of their attackers. Well, one, I corrected him. Sorta. The pile of ash at what had once been the center of the magical destruction had still been glowing slightly pink, suggesting the battle wasn't that long ago. Calamity nodded. My guess, lucky shot, he said. From the way the whole wall was disintegrated back far enough to touch the safe next door, my guess is that one of the invaders was carrying a saddlebag full of magical energy grenades, or some such, and one of the raiders put a bullet through it. Well, they obviously didn't get in through the front door, or the safe, so that means there's another way in here. I looked at steel hooves. Do you remember what the building on the other side of the bank was? Noise from somewhere above killed the conversation. Dust rained down from the ceiling as pony hooves clopped over the floor above. The hanging lamp swayed as they passed over it, a rotting piece of crucified dog falling to the floor with a meaty sound. I floated my rifle close. Calamity gave his battle saddle a reload kick. Honestly, Velvet Remedy whispered, has it ever occurred to either of you that they might be friendly? Nope. Stand back. Steelhoofs growled, gleading his intention. I dashed for the bathroom, wrapping a surprised velvet in a levitation field and pulling her in after me. Pyrolight dove through the doorway over our heads. Calamity swooped backwards towards the meeting room. Shoop. Boom. The shot from Steelhoof's grenade machine gun detonated against the ceiling in a flash of fire and stucco. With a rending crash, the ceiling came down, bringing five raider ponies crashing into the lobby. One buck with a mangy coat and a flaming skull for a cutie mark landed hard on a teller counter and bounced out of sight. A mare with a spiked pink mane got herself tangled in gruesome exhibit fashioned out of at least three colts and trails, a zebra sword falling from her muzzle and clattering across the floor. It slid to a stop at Calamity's hooves. One last raider pony stood above us at the edge of the collapsed floor, a hunting rifle floating at his flank. His gaze fell on me, sliding down my body. And now I did want to vomit. His eyes suddenly widened, and he darted out of sight. The other raider ponies tried to scramble to their feet. Steelhoofs rapid-fired six more grenades into their midst. I saw Velvet Remedy's shield flicker around the two of us, just in time to save us from the blast of shrapnel and bloody body parts. The eyeball of a raider pony splatted against the magical field inches from my face and began to slide down it. I ended up violently emptying the contents of my stomach after all. Canned corn does not taste as well coming up as it does going down. The one the fellow over here got away. Calamity called out, hovering in the air on the other side of the teller aisle. A doorway into the bank's back offices marked the raider's most likely avenue of escape. Spitting out another mouthful of water from my canteen, I replied. I had another one upstairs who bolted too. I felt weak and embarrassed, but I tried to focus on the danger at our hooves. 
the surviving raider ponies could be getting reinforcements, assuming there were any to get. I was more worried that they were setting traps. Calamity snorted. Raid is run from us now. He flew up into the room above. Of course, they could be fixing an ambush. Velvet Remedy looked up at Calamity's underside. How come now? Are you really that surprised? She poked a hoof at me. The smallest one of us is a walking arsenal. You're a pegasus with a custom-built battle saddle, and steel hooves... He's steel hooves. By Luna, we look like Grim Reaper ponies. Velvet Remedy trotted towards the carnage. Any raider this well-armed, she said, floating a blood-stained baseball bat with gruesome nails driven through it out of the rubble, is going to take one look at us and gallop for the hills if she has any brains left at all. I grimaced. Not that I minded looking like a reaper pony to raiders. I damn well ought to. But because Velvet's comment brought back memories of the twisted view of us that Steelhoves had once professed for calamity. Steelhoves was looking at the zebra sword. The gemstone in its hilt was cracked and blackened. Whatever enchantment that weapon once had died with a stone. Okay, I said, collecting my thoughts. The main vault is in the basement. The other way into the bank is probably upstairs, coming across the next building. I looked to my companions, giving them an opportunity to disagree. Velvet, Stilos, you two head up. Between the two of you, I'm sure you can greet any pony you find up there with the appropriate levels of loving kindness or overwhelming force. Velvet shot me a wry look, but nodded. How in Luna's name did I end up the de facto leader again? After seeing how my fellow stable dweller had handled a hellhound, I wasn't so worried about her safety. I'm the safe cracker, so I have to head down. Calamity, you're with me. Pow. A well-placed twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle caused a magical energy turret to explode, flinging shrapnel across the hall. Slipping into the zen of sats, I targeted two remaining turrets and unloaded two rounds into each of them. They barely got a shot off, scorching an armor plate on my utility barding and giving me a painful but bearable burn beneath. We crept up past the guard desk and peered down the hallway beyond. It had a few doors that opened to side rooms, and at the end of the massive metal door of the vault, a terminal glowing on the wall beside it. As Calamity started into the hall, I paused at the desk. I spotted the book which had slid down behind it, increasing her sales figures. The picture on the front was a satisfied customer eating an apple. I floated the book into my saddlebags, having exhausted my current book collection and left it at Junction R7. I trotted into the hallway, catching up with Calamity. A scorching bolt of green energy shot past me, hitting the wall behind us and melting a hole, turning the faux wood paneling in the bricks beneath into a glowing green goo. There's nothing better than the smell of melting zebras in the morning. Crap. One of these. Back, I shouted to Calamity. The two of us barely made it to the corner when the multi-limbed hoverbot floated around the corner. I felt flame lick at my tail as the robot hosed down the hallway we had just been in with its flamethrower. Ow, 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 ow! I pranced, flames licking at my tail until Calamity stomped the fire out. Ow! Pardon. I whimpered, tears in my eyes. Thanks. On our way down... Calamity had prodded me to unlock every ammo box, coin till, and desk. His saddlebags were now virtually overflowing with golden pre-war coins, as well as packages of cigarettes and bubblegum, and the other things he considered worth the wait. I wasn't really expecting to find a merchant we could trade with in Philadelphia, but I said nothing. I had taken most of the ammo, including a prince's prize of four magical energy grenades. Well, grenades did the trick last time, I whispered, floating two of them out. And, unlike alicorns, I'm pretty sure I can trick these things the same way twice. I sat on my haunches before the wall-mounted terminal next to the vault door, the smoldering wreckage of the hoverbot on the wall behind us. The door to this vault was almost identical to the one under Shattered Hoof, except this one had no exterior lock, rendering all my skills at lockpicking useless. However, by hacking into the terminal, I was sure I could tweak the spell matrix and get the door to slide open. Calamity stood guard over me as I worked. We both looked up when the muffled sound of an explosion echoed from somewhere several floors above. Not loving kindness, then, I guess. Nope. You know, if I survive all this, one day I'm going to sit down and write a sequel to the Wasteland Survival Guide, covering all the things Ditsy Doo managed to leave out. I loved the ghoul pony, but, seriously, a whole section on radhogs and barely a mention of hellhounds. 
and the chapter about making robots work for you was completely hoof-fucked. I concentrated on the puzzle before me, working my way through possibilities of code until I settled on the right one. This was almost as hard as Pinkie Pie's terminal. Almost. With a series of loud clanks, the vault door slid down into the floor. I raised an eyebrow at that, then stepped into the vault. Sunpony had already been in here. Only a scattering of pre-war coins remained, and most of the smaller safes that lined the walls were open and empty. Well, now I'm depressed. I took note of three smaller safes, and one large one which still seemed intact. The locks on those suggested a level of skill required that was beyond. Was this the work of the same rival lockpicker who made such a mess of Hippocampus Energy Plant Number 12? No. That would be absurd. But the little pony in my head just wouldn't give up on the notion. I started on the large safe first, confident in my ability to beat it, and eager to show up my imaginary rival. It took effort to open the safe, but the tumblers finally fell into place. The large door nudged open. I pulled it back with my telekinesis enthusiastically, driven to see what was inside. Inside were two objects, one of which I had seen before, recently, through binoculars. An anti-machine rifle. Only this one was pristine, with golden flame-styled filigree, a custom bit, deep citrines embedded in the barrel, and an embossed nameplate that read Spitfire's Thunder. It was also broken down to fit into the safe, some assembly required. Calamity whistled at the sight of the gun. My own attention was drawn to the small box next to it. The box had a familiar apple insignia on it, although just one rather than the three on Little Macintosh. I floated it out. The box had its own lock, but it looked significantly easier to pick. Them gems on that there barrel? I've seen gemstones like that before, Calamity was saying behind me, still fascinated by the gun. They hold an enchantment that sucks up the buck of the gun. Makes it so the Pegasus can fight without getting knocked off course. I chuckled. He probably thought he was going to be subtle. You want it? It's yours. I grinned. I've even got some bullets for it. The box with the apple clicked open. I realized I'd seen a box like this before. In Vinyl Scratch's safe. Like that one, this held four memory orbs. I set the open box down. Behind me, Calamity was trying to do his best not to squee. Thank you, little Pip. It's mighty gracious of you. Calamity. I shushed him with a smile. Stand guard. I might be gone for a bit. The orange main pegasus spotted the box of memory orbs and nodded, turning to face the vault entrance in a battle-ready stance. I tilted my horn down towards the box, picking up a memory orb at random and focused. The bank, Calamity, and the entire equestrian wasteland washed away. Applejack was looking at me like I had lost my mind. And just what in the hay do you think you're wearing that for? I had really hoped to learn more about the past, and with any luck, the mayors of the ministries. But to find one of them addressing me, up close and personal, this seemed beyond the stroke of fortune. The room around us looked very much like the suites in Ten Pony Tower must have been in their prime. This was a ministry hub, perhaps. There was a song playing in the background that I'd heard before. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. It took me a moment to place it, but I had once seen Steelhoves virtually entranced by that song. To remember tonight, I felt my mouth say. The words came out in a smooth, low rumble. Oh, Luna. It was Steelhoof's voice. More urbane and not nearly as gravelly as the ghoul we knew, but it was definitely him. How the hell did this memory ended up here? In this bank? It only now occurred to me that maybe Steelhoof's had known what the building next door had been, not because he had noticed it today, but because he remembered it. Oh, hell no. I ain't doing nothing while you're wearing that ridiculous recollector apple snack. Applejack put her hoof down. Now take it off. Wait. What? Oh, no. I really, really shouldn't be here. This was private, and... I'll tie you up with your own lasso. Applejack's eyes went wide, a blush forming on her freckled cheeks. 
Oh, sweet Celestia, have mercy. Not only was I invading Steelhoof's private memories, but the buck was aroused. I could feel a hot hardness that I fought to escape from. I prayed to the goddesses to pull me out of this memory, to spare me this, and my ghoul companion too. He didn't deserve to have me here, and I very much didn't want to be here. Eyes narrowing dangerously. And just what makes you think you have what it takes to best me with my own lasso, soldier buck? Part of my brain paused to marvel that the country filly turned major political figure had fallen for a city buck turned soldier. Steelhoofs. No, Apple Snack leaned forward, that hot pressure in his groin becoming unbearable for me, and whispered huskily, Because I know it turns you on. Way too much information. Please, Celestia, Luna, any pony, stop the memory. Need to get off now. Uh, I, I mean leave. Need to leave now. I almost felt my prayers were answered when a loud chiming sound rang out from a nearby glowing terminal. Applejack shook off her deer cotton and slaves light expression. Mm, still no, she decided, turning away to look towards the terminal. Now I gots to take this, and you best not be wearing that thing when I'm done. You look ridiculous. I felt my host sigh, then trot slowly towards what I recognized as the bathroom. A sudden shot of horror went through me. Applesnack was still sporting his... hardness. Goddess, please don't let them have a full-length mirror in there. A cry of dismay from the orange-coated elder mare solved my concerns with startling quickness. What's wrong? I felt myself say in Applesnack's voice. The mayor of the Ministry of Technology was scrolling through information on the terminal screen as fast as her hoof would let her. No, she moaned. No, they wouldn't. Her voice was becoming louder and more strained. No, they... they... how could they? Again, more firmly. AJ, love... What's wrong? Applejack turned towards her soldier buck with a start of tears in her eyes and a frightened edge to her voice. Hind shots, what's wrong? She spit as the other emotions struggling behind her face lost out to fury. One year. Steel Rangers have been around for one year, and Ironshot Firearms has gone and built a gun designed to punch their armor. They've gone and built a gun to kill our own. I felt Apple Snack go rigid at the news. The blood maned mare was strutting back and forth in a barely contained outrage. They're calling it the anti-machine rifle, but what it really is, is the anti-magical powered armor rifle. She spun, tears in her eyes. How long before the zebras get hold of this? They've just killed our own. I felt my host swallow. He was doing amazingly well at keeping his heart rate down, but while I couldn't sense Apple Snack's emotions, I could feel the physical toll. I put everything I had into finding a better way to keep our soldier ponies safe, Applejack raged. I sold my farm. I fought the ponies of my own ministry to get this done. She turned, her eyes wide and filled with tears. I sold my farm. A lump formed in my throat. My heart hurt for the mare, and my hose wanted to lash out at the evil ponies who could be so thoughtless. The orange pony spun and bucked her bureau so hard it shattered into splinters and piles of clothing. This is betrayal. They can't do this. My host watched as his mare looked around for something else to buck. Then she seemed to have a better idea. I'm going down there, Applejack decided abruptly. I got family down in Ironshot. Brayburn will listen. I felt a sinking sensation in my heart. Steel hoofs, Applejack barked, addressing my host not by her lover's name but by his military designation. Call Wingwright. Tell him to be on the roof in two minutes and have my personal chariot ready. If I leave now, I can make it to Ironshot before morning. Maybe I can head this whole thing off before. Applejack, love. Applesnack offered slowly, trying to be reasonable. If they've already invented it, then you can't put the apple back on the tree. I knew he was right. The other item in the safe had been proof enough of that. Applejack shot us both a look, or at least it sure felt that way. Well, some pony ain't getting any for that good bit. If I could speak, I would have told her that such expectations had long passed. Now make the call. The orange pony turned back to gaze at the scattered fragments of wooden dresses. Great. Now I've got to find something official looking to wear. Less than three minutes later, Steelhoves was saying goodbye to Applejack as she stepped into the elevator outside of their suite. 
the call to wing right had been made and the Ministry Mayor's charity was waiting on the Pegasus landing platform. I'll be back before you know it, Applejack insisted, dressed in a stiff, formal suit dress that did not appear to get much use, and looking slightly less murderous, but no less determined. I'm sorry this night ain't gone like you were hoping for. I'll make it up to you. Promise. She turned and raised a hoof, touching the button for the landing platform. As the ornate door slid closed, she cocked her head. And take that recollector off. You look. The door is closed. A soft whir could be heard as the elevator began to ascend. My host looked up, watching the arrow above the elevator door slowly glide across the numbers. Floor four, five, six. Applesnack turned back towards the door at his and Applejack's suite. The recollector was actually starting to itch. A loud twang sounded from inside the elevator shaft behind him. He spun back towards the ornate doors as he heard Applejack's elevator carriage rumble downward past this floor, gaining speed. Then there was a loud, horrendous, metal-twisting thud. I burst back to the real world, shaking from the memory, still feeling Applesnack's scream as if it had come from my own lips. Looking up, I found Steelhoof's visor staring down at me. I cringed back, wanting to crawl into the safe. His low, gravelly voice simply stated, Definitely a vice. What is unity? The voice of Red Eye sounded in my ear bloom. Calamity and Velvet Remedy had naturally taken the lead as we worked our way back through the bank. My hooves felt heavy, like mine were the ones trapped in steel. I couldn't look at steel hooves. I could feel him staring into me, not saying anything. It was so much worse than being yelled at. Unity is you. Unity is your family, your mother and your father, your brothers and sisters. Or, at least, it will be. I've seen it, and yes, unity will be me as well. But for now, I am merely its, and thus your, humble servant. The goddess has gifted me with the vision of unity, and it is she who will bring peace to this troubled land. Think of me as nothing but a courier, delivering the message of evolution. We follow the goddess in her great quest to heal this land, and all the good ponies with it. No pony dies in Philadelphia unless they choose to, and in the new Equestria, no pony will need to die again. When the time has come for your toil to be over, you have but to submit yourself. Already the goddess has taken those who come to her, pulling them to her bosom and transforming them. Their old, weak, sick bodies are peeled away, replaced by a new, transcendent form. As we were passing the open doorframe of an office, Steelhoofs lifted a metal-clad hoof and shoved me inside. He followed. Clearly, he wanted to be alone with me. Looking anywhere but him, I stammered an apology. He ignored it. Which one did you see? He asked coldly. I looked up to him, startled. Which memory did you see? I flushed with icy embarrassment. The, the one where I fought to find the least intrusive description. Applejack learned about Ironshot making anti-machine rifles. Oh, Steelhoof said. The other three memories were locked safely away in his pack. The accident. I recalled Applebloom's strained voice. Some folks are saying that maybe it wasn't so much of an accident. They say that maybe it was some pony within her own ministry. The biggest row Applejack had was over the anti-machine rifle, Steelhoofs informed me. I sensed that, having seen the memory, he wanted me to have a touch of context. It was abnormally forthcoming of him, even more odd considering how deeply in the wrong I was. On one hoof, I couldn't really blame them, Steelhoofs admitted. You wouldn't either if you saw some of the robots the Zeros had begun to deploy on the battlefield. I found myself nodding, despite the ache in my heart for Applejack. I remembered that tank-like sentinel robot in four stars. I'd fired on it with armor-piercing bullets from a sniper rifle at a distance of yards, and only a precision shot to a volatile area had managed to stop it. But I knew how bad that hurt her, and how deeply personal she took it. Only made it worse she had the family in iron shod. Whole thing just about tore her apart. He nickered behind his helmet. Damn thing was, the zebras came up with armor-piercing ammo a few months later anyways. 
not as effective as an anti-machine rifle at taking down my fellow rangers, but a well-placed round from a rifle could punch through a ranger's helmet. Steelhoves looked me over until his visored gaze stopped on little Macintosh in his holster. Truth is, with AP ammunition, that gun could do it. Little Macintosh is possibly the most powerful firearm of its size. A touch of nostalgia crept into his voice. Designed with a kind of buck to the teeth that only a mare like Applejack could handle easily. Despite how low I was feeling, a snort of laughter escaped me. According to Spike's story, Applejack was strong enough in the tooth to haul not only her own weight, but all of that of her five friends with nothing more than a bite on a dragon's tail. I had just begun to notice that all the context I was getting was about the firearms, and none about the accident itself, when a thunderous gunshot rang out. Was that Spitfire's thunder? How far ahead had Calamity and Velvet Remedy gotten, and what did they run into? I darted around Steelhoof's bulk, dashing out of the room and towards the sound. I could hear the heavy hooves of the Steel Ranger falling behind me. That was a warning shot, I heard Calamity state ahead, his voice muffled and slightly mumbling. I don't give two. Warning shots are supposed to miss, Velvet Remedy barked sternly. That didn't hit anything vital, was his response. He was speaking slow, his words sounding like they came through clenched teeth. That weapon, a gruff mare's voice insisted, is the property of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. Surrender it, tribal, and we'll let you live. Horse apples. Now, I could tell why Calamity's voice sounded so warped. He was talking while holding Spitfire's thunder in his muzzle. He was better at it than the slaver with the shovel spear whom I had encountered on my first night out, but not by much. The only reason you ain't blown us travels to bits is that you didn't want to hurt the pretty gun. I heard Pyrolite let out an alarmed squawk. Damn. Steelhose muttered from behind me as he broke into a full gallop, leaving me swiftly behind. I lowered my head, charging forward, trying to keep up. Little Macintosh floated beside me, ready for action. I came barreling into a lobby full of ponies and stumbled over the severed hind leg of a raider, losing my balance and face planting into the rubble of the collapsed ceiling. Little Macintosh clattered into the rubble. Uh, she tripped me? I offered weakly, getting up. My eyes widened as I took in the five steel rangers in the room, only one of which was steel hooves. One of the four new arrivals had taken a shot through the leg, and Velvet Remedy was fussing over it to the pony's chagrin. Calamity seemed intent on staring down the other three. Without the massive Spitfire's thunder, my companions and I would have been helplessly outmatched, even assuming steel hooves remained on our side. Steelhose was standing rigid, staring from Calamity, the unique anti-machine rifle in his teeth, to the Steel Ranger he had shot through the leg. It was as if Applejack's fears were playing out right in front of him. Calamity's habit of shooting first couldn't have reared at the worst time. The lead mayor of the Steel Ranger's quartet was splitting her focus between Calamity and Steelhose, addressing the latter. What are you doing with these primitives? Steelhose ignored her, staring at Calamity. You shot a Steel Ranger. Them friends of yours came at us with an intent to murder. Velvet Remedy spoke up again. Calamity's right. The moment they saw us, that one's missile launcher opened up. She said, pointing a hoof at one of the other Steel Rangers. And this one charged at us with a magical energy lance. I ask you again, said the lead mare, stepping forward. What are you doing here? Soldier, report. The two uninjured Steel Rangers behind her changed their battle stances to better cover the room, one of them targeting me. I cast my eyes to the floor, searching for where little Macintosh had fallen. Steelhoofs growled at Calamity. We will have words. Then, bothering to spare the mare his attention, he answered, You are not cleared for that information. You need only know that I am on assignment and that you are interfering. Now order your knights to back down. The tension in the air was nearly suffocating. I am a senior paladin in the Ministry of Wartime Technology. You will address me with proper respect to be fitting my rank. As will you, Steelhoof replied with a gravelly calm, when addressing a superior officer. A younger buck's voice sounded behind the helmet of the missile launcher ranger. Elder Steelhoofs? The question was met by a still room. I spotted little Macintosh, but didn't dare float it up from the floor, certain that some pony would start shooting. Calamity broke the silence. Elder... Well, guess who's been holding out on us? 
My apologies, star paladin Steelhoofs. The senior paladin said carefully, I did not recognize you. Your armor is that of a much lower station. Steelhoofs nickered. Apology accepted. He turned to the younger buck. And I would thank you not to call me above my station. If you know of me, then you know I refuse that position. The leading mare was not done, however. You are far from your normal stomping grounds, Star Paladin Steelhoofs. By protocol, I shall lead you to meet with Elder Blueberry Saber. The light on her helmet swiveled to illuminate each of us in turn. As for the disposition of your friends, she began. They are with me, Steelhoofs said firmly. Lead. I shall follow. The steel-encased mare turned and trotted out of the bank. Velvet Remedy stayed close to the wounded one as he rose to his hoofs, favoring his injured leg. As the rest of us began to follow, I floated little Macintosh to me. The gears in my mind were beginning to turn again, and while I knew better than to start asking questions in the middle of a tense diplomatic situation, it was clear that Steelhoofs and I needed to have a big talk. Star Paladin and Steelhoofs, sir, the young knight called out, trotting closer to Steelhoofs while the other uninjured knight covered Calamity and me with the light machine gun of her battle saddle. Uh, again, my apologies for before. The matter is past, Steelhoof said flatly. I sensed this was not a conversation our ghoul companion wanted to have. I found myself mentally cheering the young knight on. Permission to ask a question, sir? No. Oh. The knight stopped in his tracks, letting us pass him, then tried to catch back up. In that case, permission to speak freely, sir. Steelhoof's head dropped just a little. No. The knight slowed, but did not stop this time. Permission granted, Knight Boom, proclaimed the senior paladin. To Steelhoof's, she whinnied. My troops, my territory, my rules. Sir, I just wanted to say, there are a lot of steel rangers who felt the same way you do. About following in the path of the ministry's mayor, I mean. If you had taken your rightful place as an elder, a lot of us would have gladly followed you. Steelhoofs remained impassive. The silence stretched out as we trotted through the suburban wreckage that surrounded Philadelphia. Slowly, the young knight dropped back into position behind us. I heard his last words, muttered to himself, before he fell quiet for the rest of the trip. We still would. When I was a young buck, I was taught that somehow some ponies were inferior to others, that those not born as earth ponies were weak, frail, unsuited to labor incapable of pulling their own weight without relying on magic. You, my children, prove every day that the only ponies who are inferior are those who choose to be. Unity is more than just the blessing of the goddess. It is our search to transcend the laziness and weakness of our ancestors, to reach up to a higher level of existence. Unity with our fellow ponies, not tearing each other apart, but building each other up, and equestria with us. And you, my children, are already halfway there. In you I see that unity already lies within us, should we just choose to embrace it. The glorious evolution that awaits us is just icing on the cupcake. Explosions ripped through the street. Steelhose stood alongside the other steel rangers as they tore into the slavers taking cover behind the ruined chariots and carriages, and even behind the wagon full of slaves that they were transporting into the heart of Philadelphia. Red Eyes' voice died out when the grenade barrage from our ghoul's battle saddle obliterated the slaver's radio. Through the din, no pony heard the shot from above that tore through Night Buck's helmet, ripping it off his torso. His head turned to jellied mush inside. A Pinkie Pie balloon floated overhead, turned a raging fuchsia by the dipping sun. Take cover! The senior paladin yelled, and the rangers scattered. At the turn of events, the surviving slavers began to press forward, filling the street with suppressive fire. I hid behind a trash barrel as bullets riddled into it. If the bin hadn't been full of another age's refuse, the bullets would likely have torn through it and perforated my body. As it was, the few which punched through were stopped by my saddlebags and barding. I got this one, Calamity called out, soaring into the air, Spitfire slender strapped across his back, intent on going one-on-one -on -one with the Pinkie Pie balloon. From behind a mailbox, Velvet Remedy focused on invoking her shield spell bringing it to life between our Pegasus and the slaver ponies who turned their guns to fire at him. The moment their guns were trained away from me, I dove around the trash barrel, slipping into sats and putting shots into the heads of three of them, courtesy of the zebra rifle. 
Their heads erupted in flame as they fell. Two were doused in flickering green balefire that sent my pit buck clicking. They stumbled, screaming as Pyrolite flew over the slavers. I could hear shots exchanged above. The slaver pony who had been hiding behind the slave wagon, a lavender and green unicorn mare, wrapped the remains of Night Boom in a levitation field and floated it towards herself. Sats died, only to activate again, partially refreshed. I looked down the scope of the zebra rifle, but couldn't get a clear shot with the wagon of slaves in the way. They were cringing, trapped in the open. I saw one tan-coated mare mouth, don't shoot me. Wait, what was I thinking? I focused, wrapping the entire wagon in a field of my own, and gently hauled the slaver's cover out of the way. One of the other slaver ponies opened fire at me, forcing me to dive back behind cover. I felt the levitation field slip, but caught it again before I dropped the wagon full of helpless ponies. A hoot and a flash of green flame announced the death of the slaver pinning me. I turned to look back into the street, just in time to see the lavender and green unicorn floating Night Boom's rocket launcher and firing a rocket through the display window of the store where the wounded Steel Ranger had taken cover. The storefront blew out in smoke and rubble. A moment later, the Ranger Mara with the light machine gun tore at least a dozen holes in the unicorn slaver. The unique sound of Calamity's battle saddle rang through the air, coupled with an explosion. Hoorah! The Pegasus swooped down to hover over me. You see that? Shot the grenade right out of her mouth, while doing a triple somersault dodge. He pumped a hoof in the air. Who's the best shot in the equestrian wasteland? I waved a hoof at him, urging him to take cover. A crackling whoosh sound filled the air. My shadow leapt across the ground as the sky above us suddenly lit up. Pointing at his breast, Calamity indulged in a bit of gloating. Winner of the best young sharpshooter competition four years running, that's who. Oh dear, Velvet said, staring up into the air from behind her mailbox. Her face was painted with flickering light. I felt a splash of dread. Calamity, still hovering in the air above me, turned his face upward, his voice trailing off. He was watching, astonished as the Pinkie Pie balloon was consumed in flame. His mouth hung open. Flammable gas, he mouthed. The fucking slavers filled their dirigibles with flammable gas. Apparently. Little Pip, Calamity, Velvet whimpered, waving for our attention. It's falling our way. I knew I should move, but the holocaust above transfixed me. Bits of burning material started to rain down around us. My trance was broken when a blazing swath of thick cloth landed on the trash barrel next to me, draping it in flame. Celestia clopped my clip with a hoof full of sunfire. Run! I dove around the bullet-filled trash barrel, running down the street as fast as my short legs could take me. The light above was getting brighter, and I could feel waves of heat pushing down at us. I didn't know. How could I have known? Calamity shot past me. What fucking psycho pony would do that? The imprisoned ponies turned towards the inferno in the sky and screamed. The air burned in my throat. Mercifully, I still had my levitation field around the wagon. I floated it off the ground, towing it with me as I galloped down the shattered street, trying to put distance between all of us and the massive ball of fire, shaped like Pinkie Pie's head, that was now slowly crashing to the earth. I gave a prayer of thanks to Celestia and Luna. All of my companions survived. Two of the Steel Rangers, however, had not. Why? the paladin mare asked as I unlocked the wagon to set the captive ponies free. I looked to her in surprise. I started to ask what she meant, only to recall Amage's words of warning about the Steel Rangers. Honestly, most of them would be more interested in saving your pit buck than saving you. I realized the Steel Rangers probably engaged the slavers for a motivation completely different than my own. The revelation tasted... sour. Because it's the right thing to do, and because if I was in their place, I said, remembering that at one time I had been. I would want some pony to do the same for me. Velvet Remedy's ears perked. She listened in on our conversation as she moved to give aid and comfort to the ponies who had been trapped in the wagon for what looked and smelled like weeks. They were malnourished, scarred, and had slept in their own filth. One of the ponies was dead, had been long enough to begin to smell, but the slavers hadn't bothered removing the corpse. I felt a simmering rage. Turning from the sight, I stared into the impassive mask of the Steel Ranger. Why did you? 
The more Red Eye's forces advance, the more ground we lose. The senior paladin explained. He covets the technology of the past that is rightfully ours to protect. We cannot engage his army directly, so we attack his supply lines. Part of me wanted to scream at the metal-clad pony about her priorities. Instead, I scowled at the news. I had not expected the outskirts of Philadelphia to be a war zone. Philadelphia was home to both major hubs for the Ministry of Wartime Technology and the Ministry of Morale. But we lost our hub to Red Eyes' forces three years ago, and have been forced to fortify in the secondary position. My scowl increased. Any imminent plans to take it back? I felt the Steel Ranger mare glare at me behind her mask. Presumably, she was taking me to their fortification, so there was no cause not to tell me about it. But that freedom of information did not extend to anything tactical. Steelhoofs, however, stepped up and answered. No. I heard the mare nicker, bristling inside of her armor, but Steelhoofs didn't care. Why should we? By now the building has been stripped of anything worth reclaiming. Stepping closer to me, Steelhoofs demanded. Come with me. I wish to talk with you alone. Perfect. Because I wanted to talk with him. Why are you with us? We were in the burned-out husk of a small diner. Steelhoofs remained, as always, hidden and expressionless behind his armor. And not that hogwash about having nothing better to do this time, I demanded. Once we were alone, Leader Steelhoofs had vanished. Once again, I was inexplicably in charge. Only this time, I really wanted to be. You said you were on assignment. What assignment? Steelhoofs tail swayed. Remember when you eavesdropped on my conversation with Calamity? The picture I painted of you and your friends. I nodded tightly. He surprised me with his next words. I don't believe any of that, he told me. You're not a spy, or a secret agent of some Ministry of Awesome Black Ops stable. You're a good pony who is a victim of her own good nature and incessant curiosity. Sitting on his haunches, Steelhoves continued. In my assessment... You survived through luck, growing skill, and the unusual fortune of having capable friends who are willing to stick by you, even when you are amazingly stupid. Well, gee, thanks. I follow you because you are a better pony than I am. And you remind me of some pony else. You honestly strive to help and protect other ponies. I believe. He paused. There was a hitch in his voice. I believe she would have approved of you. Seelhoves dug a hoof at the red and black tiles, charred and shattered, that covered the floor. I told you before, not every steel ranger has the same view of our oath. I always believed that we should follow an example of our ministry's mayor, Applejack. That we should pledge our goals and priorities that we should protect other ponies, both with our technology and our fortitude. We weren't meant to steal and hoard. We were meant to defend. I nodded slowly. I haven't been faithful to my oath for a long time. But at your side, I can be again. I looked away, the ghoul's words sinking in. When I turned back, I fixed him with a stare. That was the most heartwarming card of horse apples I have ever heard. He stopped digging. It's the truth. Of course it is, I said. That's how you lie. If you recall, I've seen you do it before. I started walking around the Steel Ranger as he continued to sit. You tell enough truth that any pony would buy your story. But here's where the saddle rubs. All of that assessment had to have happened after you insinuated yourself into our group. If anything, you just explained why you're still with us. I stopped in front of him and pointed. So I ask again, why are you here? All right. Steelhoofs nickered, standing up, repeating his words almost verbatim. Do you remember when you eavesdropped on my conversation with Calamity, the picture I painted of you and your friends? Again, I nodded. That is what my elder believes you are and my assignment is to assess the potential threat that you and the other residents of the stable you come from represent. No more secrets. 
That was my condition for not abandoning steel hoofs. He responded by giving me the box of memory orbs as a token of submission. I had not expected that, but he insisted. After all, we both know I really couldn't just take his word. I focused on one of them, showing him trust in return by allowing myself to become helpless in his company. The world melted away. I was wet. Rain was coming down in sheets from the blackness of the night sky. I was wearing a rain slicker, but the wind buffeted at it, pulling it away. Only the top of my mane was remotely dry under the hood. Lightning flashed, illuminating the Pegasus landing platform, over two dozen floors above the bustling lights of the city below. I recognized the form of a giant scooter hovering over a well-lit building in the distance. This was Manhattan. You sure you won't be flying on a night like this, Apple Snack, sir? A dapperly dressed gray Pegasus buck asked as he shimmied himself into the harness of a sky chariot. It was a particularly beautiful chariot, adorned with a very familiar three-apple design. Very important business, I heard myself say in Apple Snack's voice. Has to be tonight. Well, that's what you pay me for, right? The Pegasus smiled. Although, it's likely to be a pretty beastly ride. I'll survive, Apple Snack said as his lightning flashed across the sky. The Pegasus gripped to the harness strap in his teeth and pulled, drawing it tight. And uh, how's Miss Applejack? I was real sorry to hear about her accident. The ponies who are supposed to be keeping those elevators in top shade ought to be sent to jail. I felt my jaw tighten. But Apple Snack kept his voice pleasantly even. Strapped in tight, wing right. I felt and heard him ask. Don't want you slipping free in the rain now. Yeah, the Pegasus laughed. That'd be one unpleasant fall. Apple Snack stepped into the chariot pressing as far forward as he could, as if afraid he might slip out of the back the moment the Pegasus launched forward. The gray Pegasus spread his wings, rain dripping off the feathers. Apple Snack moved with alarming speed. I felt myself lurch forward, biting down, grasping the Pegasus's wing in my teeth. My host drew back, pulling, drawing the wing back over the metal front edge of the chariot as he raised up a hoof. Apple Snack, what ya? The Pegasus squeaked in surprise before I felt my hoof come down on that pulled wing with a bone-crunching blow. The Pegasus screamed. Spitting out the feathers of Wingwright's now crippled wing, Steelhoofs growled, his voice low like thunder. Only three ponies knew exactly what Applejack was going to be doing riding up that elevator. God damn, my wing, my wing, what the hell? I checked your finances. Your account got a sudden influx of coins three weeks ago and an even bigger one less than eight hours after Applejack's accident. I was staring into the widening eyes of the blubbering Pegasus. My voice was dangerous low. My heartbeat wasn't raised at all. Really, you should choose something other than your filly's middle name as a password. I... I can explain, the Pegasus wailed, cradling his shattered wing. My sister died in the war. That was an inheritance. I don't think so. Apple Snack turned and stepped down off the chariot. Then I felt as my host lifted his back hooves and planted them against the rear of the chariot. Slowly he began to shove, pushing it across the rain slick rooftop with the hapless Pegasus along with it. What? No, no, no. What are you doing? Don't! The Pegasus cried out, trying feebly to push back as he was shoved closer and closer to the edge. Please, I have a family! Steelhoofs grunted, stopping. Maybe you should have thought of them before you made your choice. He gave a final hard buck to the back end of the chariot, sending it toppling over the lip of the roof, Pegasus and all. I could hear the winged pony scream right up until the chariot bounced off the first outcropping on the way to the streets down below. I felt utterly stunned, numb as my host's legs carried me towards the nearest door at a casual splashing trot. I felt him rehearsing under his breath. There's been a terrible accident. No, I have no idea where he was flying in from. I could tell he was coming in too low, but I expected him to pull up before he hit the building. It was horrible. I feel it was my fault. I shouldn't have asked Wainwright to fly in this weather. I should have known the wind shear would be too much for him. The memory ended. I stared at Steelhoofs in horror. He stared back calmly. No secrets. We are not primitive tribals, striking our hoofs against stone, hoping to create fire. We are building a better tomorrow for our children, 
and our children's children. We build it through the sweat and blood we spill to restore the foundations of industry to our great nation, because without industry there is no progress, and we are not content to allow another two hundred years to go by with pony kind reduced to scavengers. Red Eyes' speech ended, his voice replaced by what sounded like carnival music. Twilight was descending over Philadelphia when we crested a small hill and I could glean where we were headed. Nearly two-thirds of Philadelphia had been cut off, sealed up from the ruins beyond a great metal wall. The bulk of the industrial center, the amusement park whose roller coaster towered in the fading light, and the Philadelphia crater itself all hid inside. Not only did towers just inside the wall harbor guard ponies, but griffins patrolled the skies around. The glaring dirigibles above provided additional sniper cover. The secondary position of the Steel Rangers was obvious, the largest and most defensible building still intact outside the wall. The massive gear-shaped emblem on the front of the building proclaimed what it had been even better than the crumbling two-story letters that cut through it. The Steel Rangers had taken over the headquarters of Stable Tech and converted it into a citadel. Calamity flew casually past me to hover near Steel Hoofs. So you ain't an elder cause you chose not to be, he asked curiously. Maybe we ain't so different after all. I felt ice water run down my spine. Steelhoofs turned to Calamity, studying the rust-colored Pegasus for a moment. No. You flew towards your responsibilities and defiance of your own kind, heedless and ignorant of the consequences. Calamity flapped backwards a bit, a frown forming across his face. Steelhoofs continued. I ran away from my responsibilities because I understood exactly what the consequences would be if I did not. I knew there were ponies who would follow my example and I was not willing to risk a civil war amongst the Steel Rangers. Turning away from Calamity, Steelhoof said firmly, We are nothing alike. <laughs>